Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform is making it easier than ever to support Black-owned brands. When you go to walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited, you'll not only get to shop products from Black-owned brands, but also learn about founders like Janelle Stevens of Camille Rose, which specializes in products for naturally curly hair. And there are many more awesome products that you have yet to discover. It's all easy to find with Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform. Join in on celebrating Black brands today and every day at Walmart. We are Black and Unlimited. Visit walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited to discover more. That's walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jack Rico, and thank you for downloading episode 22 of the Highly Relevant Podcast. I like the show we have for you this week. I interviewed Tommy Torres, a former Ricky Martin producer turned singer, who for the first time ever revealed to me why he and other Latin musicians fear crossing over into the English language mainstream. We also chat with a premier Hispanic news anchor in our country, Telemundo and NBC's Jose Diaz Ballard, who was invited to the private Trump meeting with network anchors this week and reveals to us never before heard details on the meeting and what he said to Trump himself. That plus my film review of Marvel's new Wolverine film, Logan. From influential producer to pop star, Tommy Torres is known in the Latin music industry as the man behind many of the hit songs from Ricky Martin, Juanes, and Alejandro Sanz. But his love for music and performing has made him one of the most talented and respected musicians in the Latino music scene. Tommy Torres, welcome to the Highly Relevant Podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, I read your bio, and I have to be honest with you, you remind me so much of uh, Robin Thicke who went from producing to becoming a solo artist. How did you end up becoming a producer? <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's a good question, because most people ask me, how did I end up becoming an artist? And I have to sort of explain it. It was the other, the other way around. <laughs> I, I, I started uh, originally, I uh, studied music engineering, I mean, sound engineering and, and production, uh, with an idea of becoming a sound engineer. I worked uh, up here in New York for five years at the old uh, Sony Music Studios, uh-huh. and I got a lot of experience there. I mean, I was an assistant uh, from the studio, uh, uh, um, and lots of great sessions would happen there. Mariah Carey uh, recorded uh, wow. like three albums there. A lot of the MTV Unplugs, like Nirvana, Stone Temple Pilots, 10,000 Maniacs, uh, were on there while I was uh, oh, wow, working with there. Oh, Natalie Merchant, yeah. And and so I got a lot of experience. Like uh, Michael Jackson, I, I I spent three three days assisting a session for Michael Jackson. That's so nuts, man. Uh, and then, but then I I wanted to do my own music, so I started doing my own demos, sending them out. And it was a little while until uh, some you know they started catching people's attention. And without me actually going for it specifically for the produ- for production thing. People started asking, so who produced the demo? And it's like, no, that's something I did myself at home. And like, well, why don't you come with <laughs> And so they, I, I, got, I started getting a lot of attention, and especially after I released my first album, which I, I produced myself. A lot of people would call me for produ- producing, and then Anita Nazario was one of the first big artists that called me to, to produce a that's couple crazy. songs for her. And from there, Ricky Martin, um, you know, just coming off the, the Living La Vida Loca, you know, success. He called me and said, "Like, listen, I heard what you did with Anita. She's a good friend of mine. She she thinks you're great. Why, why don't we get together?" So it's been word of mouth. Uh, production career all of a sudden started, and and it's great because I, I've been able to do my music also, but collaborating with so many artists has been able to keep it, you know, keep the music fresh for me. Has been able to keep me like like on top of you know learning. Uh, all kinds of different styles of, of, of making music. Billboard is calling your tour as one of the most anticipated Latin tours of 2017. Um, yeah. What exactly... I like the sound of that. Yeah, right? <laughs> what exactly is it that you're offering uh, that's different than the other Latin acts? Well, that's a tough question to answer because it's, it's hard to describe yourself or, or your own music. It's it's easier for for me to describe somebody else. It's like you ask me about that Yankee, I can sort of like yeah. see. I, like, but, but then when you ask me what makes my my show different, it, it's it's a hard question. I I can tell you that from a musical point of view, I think everybody that's been following me 
kind of knows it's about the music with me. It's not really about the dancers. And there's something that I think about when I when I try before going on stage. It's like I just I just want to become music. The 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 way that people I think get entertained at the end of the day is they see somebody you know truly becoming their art form and right. and that's what I try to get myself into I just I just try to you know get really into it as if I was by myself it's it it seems to work at the beginning wh- when I started doing this the live shows were a bit a bit of a stress for me because I remember I thinking that people were out there to judge to give me like some sort of a criticism you know or a score, <laughs> as if you're a, an American idol or something like that. Yeah, I like you. Know, like, and it's not really about that. You're gonna see me, you know, on the piano. You're gonna see me on the guitar, on the electric guitar, on the ukulele. You're gonna see me, uh, you know, involving the the band, involving the the audience. It's 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 a fun show, but it's hard to describe why. <laughs> <laughs> I totally get it, man. You have a hit song with Daddy Yankee called "Do Yo." How would you describe this song, and how did Daddy Yankee become involved? Yeah, well, uh, Daddy Yankee and I met uh, at some ASCAP awards a uh, couple years back. I, I would I would say about five years back, and he had said, you know, you know, we should get together at some point, see what comes out. Uh, you know, he'd be very interested on on working with me, and and you know, I I liked the idea. I just couldn't figure out what to do where. I would still feel true to uh, the type of music I do because uh, a lot of the, the the stuff that's been done recently between pop artists and and urban reggaeton artists has been reggaeton songs with a feature from a pop artist doing maybe the chorus or something like that. You know, the the, the pop artist um, kind of sings a little melody, but the song is still like a not beat reggaeton uh, urban song. Right. Uh, in this case, I, I thought I, I could do something where I could just kind of meet him halfway from a production <laughs> point of view. I did the, it's still a ballad, it's a love ballad, it's still a love ballad tempo, and, and the song is still, you know, the song that I wrote on the piano, there's no, there's no dancing to it. It's, 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 it's one of those songs that you kind of sing along or, or listen to the lyrics. But, I, I I produced it in a way where it was more electronic, so it would have a little more weight on the beat. Mm-hmm. And so I I, I felt like it, I I bet that he would sound great on this. So what it, you know what what ended up happening is that he met me on my world. You know he came <laughs> to the ballad world and rapped on top of a, like a pop ballad, and, and it came out great. I, I I don't know a lot of rappers that could do that. He he pulled it off. It sounds very natural. <laughs> It's, I, I like the combination. It's like it's. I, I, I would dare to say I haven't heard like a, a, a Spanish pop ballad with a rapper. Uh, until this one. <laughs> Let me ask you something. What do you think is the magic behind Daddy Yankee? I mean, his longevity is uh, unequaled. I remember him from the days of Gasolina when he literally blew up on the scene, uh, crossed over into mainstream radio, that track, uh, and he's still out there right now. What, what makes him so special? Well, I mean, from what I've noticed, I think he's, part of it is his work, at, work ethic. He's like a nonstop you know, working guy. He's like very on top of everything. He handles his own business. He handles his own record company from day one. He's done. Every, he, he really knows uh, the business and and really is like nonstop as as far as work. But you know, obviously that doesn't make somebody a big star necessarily. You could be you could work very hard if you don't have the talent. Uh, from a musical point of view, I think he's different in that. His style of rapping, it's 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 unparalleled in in Spanish. I think there's very few rappers that could go, you know, with his pocket. You know, that music mu- musically we call it pocket, which is the groove that he puts on the. When he comes in on a song, there could be a bunch of rappers, but when he comes in, you notice it's something changed. There's there's he, he does have a very groove, a very specific groove to the way he raps. 
And he also has, I, I think, I, I was just talking about some, uh, this uh, the other day with somebody. Uh, he, he has an ear for Hook, and You know, I just, I just heard that song that, that he just did with Fonsi, Despacito. Uh, and, and, you know, you know, it, when he comes in, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, pasito a pasito, suave, suavecito, that thing just hits you over the head. You know, you can't stop think, you can't, you know, you, the whole song is great, but once you hear that <laughs> pasito a pasito, suave, suavecito, you can't get that out of your head for the rest of the day. He has an ear for hooks, and, and I think, In any style of music, once you have that, you, you're you're going to be successful because uh, you, you know that's that's the the key to making uh, memorable music. Congratulations, by the way, on the Jesse E. Joy album "Un Besito Mas." Just won the Grammy Award, the English language Grammy Award, not too long ago. I know you pr you helped produce that, right? Yeah, I, I, I produced uh, one of the songs. Uh, actually, I sing on that song too. Um, it's called Tres AM. In, in this album, they, we collaborated in, in more songs, about six of the songs. So I'm, I'm really happy. Oh, absolutely. So I just spoke to them on the podcast, like right before they won the Grammy. And we spoke about bilingual music because Un Besito Mas, they re-released it as a bilingual album. And I thought that was really, really interesting. And it's it plays into my wheelhouse. Porque yo hablo español, but I also speak English. My parents are from Colombia. I was born in New York. It's that bilingual, bicultural lifestyle that I think yeah. is the future of the country. So Romeo, yeah. Romeo Santos, doesn't want to sing in English. And neither does Juanes because if you ask them, they want to break into the mainstream their way in Spanish. And then you got right. Prince Royce, who's now singing in, in English. Mexican band Rake, Jesse E. Joy as well. They're all singing in English. So I want to know from you, do you believe that Spanish language music will become mainstream anytime soon? Well, um, in, in a lot of ways it already has. If you, if you look at YouTube, which is uh, by, by any consideration the most important uh, medium that we have for music today, it's bigger than any other radio station or any other streaming service. It's really? Just the numbers are, are astounding. Yeah, that's pretty much, that's it as far as, as, far as uh, you know, reach. But whether that, in let's just thinking of the U.S., whether Spanish-spoken music will, will be mainstream, I guess, I guess not in traditional radio, because radio is kind of, divide themselves by the market they, they want to reach. But um, I, I, I do think that there is a space for being true to who you are in whatever language. So maybe maybe bachata in English is not something Romeo sees. I think it could work. Uh, you know, and the same thing with Juan is, I think his music could work in English beautifully. Uh, I that's, myself, interesting. That, that's interesting. That's interesting that you say there. that because <laughs> the thing is that bachata is very native to the Dominican Republic, and so right. Aventura and Romel Santos have modernized it with like a pop vibe in order to make it more digestible. And Juanes really comes from a very Colombian like folk, right. you know, uh, sensibility, and I just think it's really hard to translate that into the type But of pop music that we're conditioned to listening to. That's true. Um, definitely, if you, if, you, if, you base, if you base it on what's happening right now with radio and, and stuff like that, then you would definitely think that it wouldn't work. But I, I think there was a time, let's just say, mambo music. Right. Cuba and cha-cha-cha and all that stuff. All of a sudden, somebody dared to do it in English, and then they did I like it like that, and then they, they did a bunch of... And then all of a sudden, the Americans would be singing, you know, Um, you know, boleros and, and, and music that you would think would not, you know, would, wouldn't interest the American market, and it did. So I think so long as you can dance it, and so long as the, the you know, the, the spirit of the whole thing remains, doing it in English uh, will not change that much. I, I, I am the, the type of artist that has kind of limited myself to doing only Spanish thing. I'm in Spanish, uh, my music in Spanish, just because I feel more comfortable. I'm a little self-conscious uh, of my accent when I sing in English and, and stuff like that. But I think that's only in our minds. I think we're the ones that are putting the limits to it. I think, you know, once 
once you dare to do it, I mean, Shakira's biggest hits are reggaeton based, you know, are not, her biggest hits are not like rock and roll songs or, or ballads. Or her biggest things are, are something that, you know, La Tortura, you know, uh, stuff like, you know, that she's been doing. It's, it's, so it's like, it, it doesn't matter if it's Spanish or English. It's just that the beat, people like it and people were able to sit, dance to it. Tommy, you know, l- let me ask you this question because it's something that's been bugging me for years, man. You know, um, and I remember I saw Luis Fonsi one day. And this was back in like in 2000, 2001. It was post Living La Vida, Loca from Ricky Martin. And he had come to New York and I was gonna, I was about to interview him. And we had talked about his ambitions and where he wants to go. And in my mind, every time you become a singer, your whole ambition and goal in life is to become the Ricky Martin of La Vida, Living La Vida Loca, you know, boom, right? Uh, and... Luis kind of said, you know what? I really don't have interest in being Ricky Martin. I have a major interest in being Luis Fonsi. So it kind of redefined to me that if you get into music, it's not to become a superstar. It's just to kind of sing music. But this is a business. And I feel like if you sing in English or you cross over, then the studio's pressuring you to sing in English. You feel like you have to sing in English to reach a wider global audience. That way you can retire young. Am I crazy, or is that not the ambition of every artist now? There's, there's not a, a clear black and white yes or no answer to that. I will give you that most artists, even though they deny it, their, their ambition is for their music and their art form, art form to be heard and loved by the most people possible. So if you ask... I, uh, the, I, a friend of mine from the from the industry would say, like, you know, every artist wants their song to be like a historic song that it, the whole world can sing. You know, whoever tells you otherwise, you know, they're just trying to like, you know, say just in case it doesn't happen. No, that's not what I want. But but in a way, I have to be honest with myself too. As a musician, there's my priority is always to to be uh, true to the music I like. So I would never do a song just because it sounds like it could be the next Macarena or... Or, or the next Hipstone or, Live from Shakira and White Clay the next Jean. Lambada. <laughs> well, Hipstone Live is actually a pretty cool song. I, will, I, I wouldn't mind doing that. But <laughs> that's actually an actual song. But, but you know what? La Maca, you know, Macarena or... or They're you know, very gimmicky. They're wonders, very gimmicky, that, right. That, that you know it's going to be a hit, but you know, like if I do that, that's going to be the end of, of, of my dignity <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh most are like all artists want the biggest amount of exposure and the biggest amount of success when it comes to you know people loving their music i mean why would you would you want only a few people to love your music when you you know if you could have the whole world love your music everybody wants to get to la vida loca status to be a superstar but yeah what, a megastar yeah but what are you willing to sacrifice that's a different thing because uh, Ricky did not sacrifice anything by doing that, but a lot of people think they have to. I mean, Ricky stayed true to who he was. He didn't, like, change, uh, you know, he stayed doing, you know, what he was good at. But, however, the, the, um, the other thing that I was going to say is that I, I do think that um, a lot of times fail, uh, fear of failure uh, in when we have had success in the Spanish market, fear of failure in the English market makes us limit ourselves to not do music in English. And that's when we say, you know, I really don't, I really don't want to do music in, in English. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I think, I, I, um, and I am including myself. I'm not pointing any fingers. I'm, I'm, I'm including them myself in that point, in that uh, bunch. Right. Because, uh, unfortunately... When you've had success and you're like, what would happen if I do something in English and nothing happens? Everybody will know, uh, 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 he failed at that. You know, it's like, so you don't want that kind of pressure um, 
it's it's one of those things, man. So I, I'm I'm being totally honest. I don't think I've told this to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, that's so awesome, man! And well, I'm glad you got to do it here on the podcast. You can catch Tommy Torres on tour next in Orlando on March 31st and in Miami on April 1st. Tommy, thanks for coming on the podcast, man. Great conversation. Oh, thanks a lot, man. Uh, let's do it again soon. It's time for Jacked In. Let's begin with the top movie news of the week. Beauty and the Beast will introduce Disney's first gay character. The new trailer for Pirates of the Caribbean Dead Men Tell No Tales debuted this week with footage of Oscar winner Javier Bardem as Captain Salazar. And Oscar Isaac and Christian Bale star in the new Arminian genocide movie, The Promise, releasing April 21st. Changing over to the small screen, Colombian actress Sofia Vergara might be soon without a TV job. The cast of ABC's Modern Family still has not negotiated contracts, leaving the future of the show uncertain. Jennifer Lopez's NBC police drama Shades of Blue begins season two Sunday, March 5th. Netflix's original Mexican series Ingobernable with Kate Del Castillo premieres March 24th. Brad Pitt's satirical comedy War Machine premieres on Netflix May 26th. And season two of the hip-hop musical The Get Down will premiere on Netflix April 7th. Switching over to music. I do my makeup in somebody else's car. After a three-year hiatus, singer Lord returns with a major comeback single called Green Light. Spotify hits 50 million paid subscribers. Demi Lovato will lend her voice to the new Smurfs movie, and Shakira and Carlos Vives are accused of plagiarism for the hit song La Bicicleta. The biggest news coming out of the social media universe, Snapchat just went IPO and it's now valued at $24 billion, with NBC Universal investing $500 million in it. Facebook launched a new app on Apple TV, letting users watch live and on-demand videos on your big screen TVs. And Time Inc. debuted this week a new social media brand called Well Done, targeting food lovers who consume and share videos. And before we move on to our next interview, we want to congratulate Latina anchor Ana Cabrera, who joined CNN as their new anchor of weekend primetime programming. As the only national network news anchor to appear in Spanish and English language broadcast news programs, Jose Diaz Ballard is walking with a pep in his step. Telemundo is now the number one Spanish language network news in the U.S., and Noticias Telemundo is now getting attention from President Trump himself. Jose, great to have you on the show again, and felicitaciones on Telemundo being the number one Spanish language network in the U.S. What is Telemundo doing differently than Univision? The network news is is growing uh, when many others are are actually uh, getting smaller in their audience. We're getting a larger uh, audience every day. And I think it has a lot to do, Jack, with the fact that we are really serving our community um, in uh, in an unbiased and, and I think, thorough uh, way. Last week, you hosted your fifth news special since Donald Trump was elected president. (laughs) Yeah. What kind of impact, personally and professionally, have you seen from these specials in these town halls? It's really uh, amazing to be able to have the privilege to to have these hour-long specials uh, on prime time in Telemundo Network. Um, You know, one of them, the the one we had, I think, just recently, uh, shattered all records. You were number one on prime time. Yeah, number one, as a matter of fact, number one for the entire day uh, on any network in Spanish. It was like about 1.5 million people watched you and this uh, special and you were saying that it's because of the appetite, right, for, for consumer there's a, news. There's about- a huge appetite and a huge need. There's a lot of fear and uncertainty in, in our community, Jack. And a lot of people simply are hungry to know the facts so they can best deal with what they may be confronting in the future. Is, is the fear real? Yes. No doubt about it, Jack. There is a real fear. There's a fear of the unknown. Uh, you know, anytime there is a change of government, you know, people wonder what, how a new government, a new president is going to impact their lives. Mm-hmm. When this president, uh, as a candidate, uh, repeatedly talked about uh, immigration and the need for deportations. Let's not remember, let's not forget that early on in his campaign, he talked about uh, 
a, you know, a deportation force yes. and uh, massive deportations. Since then, he has softened that tone. Uh, but the, um, you know, when remember, I mean, look, you know, we've just gone through eight years uh where there were the most number of deportations in the history of the United States yeah, uh, under President Obama. They called him the and chief now, deporting uh, president. <laughs> right. And now you have someone who, since his first day running for president, has essentially said, you know, uh, that's going to seem, seem, seem small potatoes compared to what I want to do. <laughs> and so when, when you have that rhetoric for over a year, mm-hmm. um, you know, and then he, he becomes the president, then there is a lot of concern. Let's remember, let's go over some numbers, Jack. 6.5 million people in this country live in a mixed status family household. 6.5 million people live in a household where there is a legal permanent resident or a United States citizen and an undocumented. That's six and a half million people. When you add that to the number of people of the 58 million Latinos that live in this country, mm-hmm. most U.S. born, who know someone who may, may be undocumented, know someone who is being deported or has been deported. Uh, some of them have family members that are undocumented. You know, that's, that's a lot of people. And, <clears throat> and when it seems as though the priorities will change as far as who gets deported or who's defined as a criminal, then you have a lot of people concerned and worried. And that's, I think, the important aspect of Noticias Telemundo, las cosas como son, things as they are. Because when you have activists telling you what you want to hear and then what happens is not what you thought was going to happen or was what happens is something you don't want to hear. CNN contributor Ana Navarro is a part of your specials. What does yep. she bring to the table? She brings a passion and a very open and... Um, raw perspective on things in the sense that, you know, she's, she's a Republican. She's been a Republican all her life. She's worked with and for Jeb Bush and the Bush, uh, you know, family. Uh, and, and she is someone who has seen in Donald Trump, her nemesis. And so, uh, you know, she's also a Nicaraguan American who came here looking for, along with her family, for a new and better life, like so many millions of people have. And so Ana Navarro talks about what it is in the final analysis that this is all about, which is people. You anchor the national Telemundo daily news program, Noticias Telemundo, and the Sunday Current Affairs show, Enfoque con José Díaz y Balart. To me, journalism as a whole is going through a massive crisis in this new Trump administration. How is Hispanic news adapting to this new presidency? I think that, you know, the the, um, the discussion of, you know, fake news and when that's thrown around and, 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 you know, the president has said that, you know, fake news is CNN and MSNBC and it's, it's, it's not a positive it's 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 a negative towards i think just democ- democracy and the rule of law and you know look you can disagree and and vigorously with something that a reporter or a correspondent or even a network uh, says about you or a political slant they have against you but to label journalists as fake news, I think, is is very counterproductive. You know, this is funny that you're bringing this up because there's a huge controversy and a huge debate happening in journalism right now whether people should assume fake news as an insult or an offensive term. Where do you lay in between those two? Is it just words or is it more than just words? Is it insulting to you? Yeah, I, I am not one of those who um, thinks that being labeled a fake news uh, outlet is the same as a racial epithet. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, when I have seen and, and lived through and witnessed, uh, you know, racial injustice, um, and, and I have in my, you know, uh, 32 year plus career covering news around the world, seen, uh, authoritarian regimes and even, you know, totalitarian regimes and how they act. I don't compare that with you think right. that it is counterproductive for the democratically elected president of a nation of the most powerful, free and prosperous nation on earth to label any group of people, anything to label journalists 
en masse as the providers of fake news to, as he said, when President Trump ran for office, um, you know, some summers ago, two summers ago, almost, uh, you know, that those that cross the border without documents are rapists and murderers. Um, I think it's the broad brushing of any group of people, I think is counterproductive. Uh, but I don't in any way, uh, compare that to, you know, the uh, totalitarian, um, temptations, (laughs) <laughs> of many uh, regimes uh, and authoritarian regimes around the world. Right. One of the things that I have found flabbergasting, I'm just flummoxed by the whole thing, is the fact that Donald Trump has not given you a one-on-one since he was elected president of the United States. Right. Uh, and I'm working on that. I did. I was in a meeting last Tuesday with uh, the group of television anchors invited to the lunch at the White House. I was just going to ask you about that. Uh, so I understand you and several of the top network news anchors met with Trump before his speech in the Congress. Uh, I know Chuck Todd was on it because he was on uh, MSNBC talking about it. Uh, and several, was there, Scott so was Pelley. David Who Muir was in ABC, there? Yeah. Who so was, was in there? Who was uh, in there? It was about 20 people. And, and can I give you, Jack, a quick background and kind of an off the record on... There's a lovely tradition that so far has really been unreported um, that the presidency, and not the president, but the presidency, has had uh, since, I believe, Eisenhower days, uh, where the afternoon of a uh, State of the Union address, uh, the president hosts a lunch with I guess immediately in the earlier days, it was with the top, I don't know, uh, newspaper men and women uh, around the country, but then evolved into a lunch with the main television anchors. And did you get like an email? Was it like a press release directed specifically at you? No, because until until this last week, it was a completely off-the-record meeting. So so, much for that, right? (laughs) Yeah, so historically... What has happened is that this lunch, which uh, under President Obama ended up being about three hours on average, the nine times I, I went to that lunch with the president, um, it, was off, it wasn't on his record, and, and we couldn't even say we were there. And so we had a, a period of about, I guess it was about eight of us, a lunch, private lunch, where you could talk about and ask him and discuss anything, because whatever was discussed, we couldn't even say we discussed. What did you ask him if you had a chance to talk to him? Well, let me just give you a quickie. Then this time around, it was announced that the president was going to have a lunch and that it was going to be on his schedule and that it wasn't going to be off the record. It was going to be on background, Wow, which changes things. And instead of the eight or 10 people, I think there was about 20 people invited this time around. So what changed was that it was in our schedule. And that we could say we were going to have that meeting with the president. And then the president was very candid and open. And, and at the end, even agreed to have some on-the-record statements. So it was a, it's a different style. Not unusual, as I say, to have it. But it is uh, always an interesting opportunity to get, kind of a, get an understanding from the president of what he sees as being the priorities of his administration, the afternoon of the State of the Union, or in this case, you can't call it a State of the Union because he hasn't been there a year, but the equivalent of a State of the Union. Oh. And and so about 20 of us were there, and and, uh, and we as a group, collective, uh, there were representatives of, uh, of uh, Univision and, and Telemundo, uh, and we asked him about immigration, and, uh, and that's where the news that day was made uh, when he said that he thought that this was a... Uh, appropriate time now for Congress to to get involved in immigration reform as long as both parties could get together. So, did you get to ask a few questions? And what oh, did yeah, you say? Oh yeah, yeah, we always do. And and uh, qué te dijo? ¿Qué fue lo que te dijo? Bueno, habló de inmigración. I mean, the, the questions, the back and forth on the questions were about immigration. And um, and one of the question, one of the one of the answers was what he said that. He believed that it was this is the time for Congress to move towards a an immigration proposal, and we asked him, "Well, what would that mean?" I mean, you know, immigration proposals could be considered uh, building the wall. You know, uh, what do you, what does that mean? And he said, "Well, I think that uh, my specific question, I believe, or a follow up, was um, about his his statement that 
it was a good time to have immigration reform now. And, and well, what does that mean to you? What about the 11 million undocumented? And he said, I think that if they can get to an agreement, I would support if uh, there was a path to legalization for those who had not committed any crimes after crossing the border. And then he said, specifically, I don't think uh, a pathway to citizenship, but maybe something where they could be legalized, where they would have work permits, where they could come out and work and, and study and, and pay taxes. And so it, then he didn't talk about it in, in the right. In the, in no, the no, he didn't. He, he was night. very vague about it. And, and, you know, my main thing here is, Jose, look, I'm just telling you as, as an observer, as someone who, who loves Hispanic media, I feel that basically there's something that tells me that Donald Trump isn't very friendly to Hispanic news media. Uh, it's been impossible for Jorge Ramos at Univision to get an interview. and But we, we know why. That that's more of a personal issue more than anything. Well, yeah. And, and, and look, I mean, the, the, the president we have seen has thin skin and, um, and doesn't react to uh, what he perceives are uh, slights against him well. Uh, but you know, you may yeah, remember that, I had that. Right. You may remember that he had that encounter with me in Laredo, Texas. I remember that. Uh, everyone, and, everyone remembers that. And you know what? He brought it up at the lunch. Get out of here. Uh, he said, and I shouldn't even say this publicly, but he said, Hey, Jose, um, you and I had that issue in Laredo. And, <laughs> oh and he God. said, and I'm glad we did. I can't and believe that. He didn't seem upset by it, which is an interesting thing. The other thing is that who would have thought that he would have remembered a confrontation? So I think that he, you know, it's, we continue to insist on an interview with the president. I think that it's important and vital. Right. Certainly people in his administration know uh, the importance of the Hispanic community. And um, he was, I have to be very honest with you, he was, uh, you know, very cordial to all of us. At that uh, well, lunch, great there were some hear. people there that have been very critical of the president. Changing topics for a second, Jose. A few weeks ago, I posted on Twitter a side-by-side -side photo of you and reporter Gabe Gutierrez on the NBC Nightly News Weekend Edition. Oh, I saw that, and I thank you for that, Jack. Two Latinos opening the program, leading yeah. with a Latino story on a general market broadcast show. I don't think that uh, that's ever been really done. I mean, unless you've done nope. it before, but... I have to say it was new to me. It, it was a new image, visual reference of what Hispanics and diversity can do for a general market network. It didn't even hit me like only afterwards. Do you think general market news has finally embraced diversity on their air and behind it? Or do you think there's still more work to be done? No, I think, Jack, there's a lot more work that still needs to be done. The fact that what you noticed with your sensitivity is unusual. And it shouldn't be unusual. It shouldn't. The fact it that shouldn't. it still is unusual and unique uh, shows you that there's a lot more that needs to be done. But I, w I, I was particularly grateful to you that you mentioned that because the fact that, you know, a nightly news program called NBC Nightly News with Jose diaz <laughs> yeah, would lead on a story related to Latinos and uh, shepherded by Gabe Gutierrez who, by the way, his last name was stated correctly in the introduction. Mm -hmm. I said, we have more from Gabe Gutierrez. That's right. Uh, and that he was, that, just that, I think is a huge step forward. And it shows a lot about NBC News and NBC Nightly News, that program, and how they see America and they see the, the future. So NBC Nightly News and, and NBC, I think, you know, is really leading the way on that. Uh, but a lot more needs to be done. But I also have to applaud ABC that has Tom, Tom Yamas, Yamas as its main anchor. Who's a former NBC for New York uh, anchor as well. And, and, and colleague of mine at NBC uh, Miami. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Tom Yamas, who, who is their anchor on the weekends. And, you know, look, there there is progress, very real progress, uh, but that image of you know, two Latinos uh, leading a lightly newscast in English um, and, and taking, you know, a, a subject that is could be traditionally or at least included a lot of Latinos, uh, I think is is remarkable. 
I think we need to applaud it. And it's also needs to be kind of commonplace. It was a proud moment for me and for uh, everybody that also retweeted that, the level of embrace and support. uh, It was just a moment for for us to kind of just, you know, pat our backs as a Hispanic culture and see, look how far we've gotten. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. We need more people like you. We need people to speak out. And when, you know, there's a moment to acknowledge something that is a positive step, as you did, to acknowledge it, but also to to also pressure and keep pressure on uh, the, our news uh, organizations around the country. I love talking to you, Jose. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> I, 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 I can talk to you for well. hours. <laughs> you can catch Jose diaz Bolard on Telemundo every weekday on Noticias Telemundo at 6.30 p.m. every Saturday night on NBC Nightly News and Enfoque on Sunday mornings. Jose, thanks for coming on the podcast. Well, gracias. I, I so admire you, man, and I so appreciate you. Before we head on to our review of Hugh Jackman's Logan, here's a listen to the tracks I've been obsessing about this week. Luis Fonsi and Daddy Yankee, Despacito. Moving on. Not the friends that you used to be. John Mayer, moving on and getting over. It's been so long since I got to hold you, but I still can't seem to get you off my mind. Double's not so dangerous, dangerous. Double's not so simple, it's made for us. Frankie J, not so dangerous. Dangerous, dangerous. Hugh Jackman stars one last time as the iconic Wolverine in Logan, the much-anticipated film that sees our loner mutant fulfilling a destiny that could prove to be mortal. She needs our help. Someone will come along. Someone has come along. This X-Men film is very different than any superhero movie you'll see. It's a movie that defies comic book conventions and instead builds a realistic and intimate human drama that separates it from the pack. We got ourselves an X-Men fan. Maybe a quarter of it happened. And not like this. The action here is used as a driver to push the story forward, not necessarily as pure entertainment value. All in all, Logan is a violent, dystopian, heartbreaking, R-rated film about mortality that reflects much of our own fate. Whatever it is you think I am, she needs our help. Someone will come along. You still have time. And that's a wrap for our 22nd episode of the Highly Relevant Podcast. I want to thank Tommy Torres and Jose diaz Ballard for joining me on the podcast this week. I hope you liked it. And if you want to reach out to me, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Twitter at Jack Rico Official. Also, please subscribe and leave a review. We're now on Spotify, Google Play, and Stitcher. See you again next Friday on another episode of Highly Relevant. Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform is making it easier than ever to support Black-owned brands. When you go to walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited, you'll not only get to shop products from Black-owned brands, but also learn about founders like Janelle Stevens of Camille Rose, which specializes in products for naturally curly hair. And there are many more awesome products that you have yet to discover. It's all easy to find with Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform. Join in on celebrating Black brands today and every day at Walmart. We are Black and Unlimited. Visit walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited to discover more. That's walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited.